Well, I'm delighted today to have Mafuza with us. Um, I, I met her a few weeks ago and I was so intrigued by her story. I thought, oh, we must have Mafuza on, um, on Real Lives. But actually, um, I'm going to try and call you Fuzi, if that's all right with you. Is that is that fine? It's fine, yes. It's great to have you. Now, um, Fuzi, your background certainly isn't English. You, you were brought up, to begin with at least, in Pakistan. That is correct. Yes, whereabouts? Uh, my father is from Lahore. I was born there. And mm -hmm. my mother is from Lucknow uh, in India. Right. And, and I think you came from quite a large family. Yes, we are. We are 10 daughters and two sons. <laughs> they, <laughs> Poor they, boys. They say it's cheaper by the dozen, but it was quite the opposite. <laughs> sure. And what number are you? I'm right in the middle after um, I'm the fifth daughter in 10 and I'm the sixth child in 12 because there is one brother before me and I call him the comma and the youngest brother is at the end and I call him the full stop. <laughs> Wonderful. And uh, that, that's an amazing family. What was it like growing up in a family like that? I think it is a great blessing to be in a big family, a large family, because uh, you learn to deal with the world better when you have so many uh, close knit uh, people around you, all with different personalities, different um, uh, likes and dislikes, and you, you are all not the same. We're all individual. Mm. So when you step out into the world, uh, you know, for schooling, for uh, education, career, whatever, you've already learned how to deal with so many personalities. Mm, absolutely true. Wonderful. And are all your brothers and sisters still alive? Uh, my eldest sister is no longer with us. All right. And do you all keep in touch with each other? Yes, very closely. Most yeah. of my family are in Toronto, Canada. Oh. I have uh, one sister in Houston, in America. And I have one sister in Portugal, in the well, Algarve. Wonderful. Uh, absolutely amazing. Well, it's great that you're in England. But um, now, Pakistan, of course, we always think of as a strongly Islamic nation. Were you brought up in a Muslim family? Um, I am from an Ahmadi sect of Muslims, which are considered heretics. Oh, right. Uh, because they, um, it, it's a bit like... Uh, John the Baptist, who said uh, a greater uh, one will come after me and he will uh, save the world. So most Muslims believe in the Prophet Muhammad. In fact, they have a, a very similar book to that of the Old Testament, uh, where they mention Christ, they mention him as a prophet. They have included mm. him as a prophet. First came the Jews, then the Christians, and then the Muslims. But the Muslims have a very, um, and they won't like me saying this, have a very Jewish uh, approach to God in that they are very uh, into historical things, into um, uh, the rituals of, of particularly to do with uh, salvation they they do not eat pork mm. uh, or any part of the pig uh, but they do believe in certain uh, religious events throughout the year where you have certain feasts which I have been carried down through hundreds of years mm. and are of um, a religious nature it's not just a meal mm -hmm. uh, in, in christianity we don't have the same um very harsh rituals because because we have christ that suffices uh, to cover for all other things but that's not how you're brought up no 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 so you i was brought up uh, in a lot of female uh, muslim family and because we were many females, um, we could comfort each other in, in a 
country that did not value females. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think for my father, it must have been more than a total nightmare because they look for sons to mm -hmm. take over the role of um, financially providing the bread mm -hmm. for the family, et cetera, because Pakistan was not, and in many ways is still not into, uh, apart from women working, Muslim women working in the West, uh, about women working. They mm -hmm. still haven't got uh, a total acceptance in that unless you are in a in a position of uh, being a, a nurse or doctor to mainly the same sex mm -hmm. or a teacher mainly to the same sex let's come back to you um at what age did you come to the uk i was about three i had okay. all my uh primary school teaching and secondary school teaching in a little village in thorpe near surrey near stains and Egham. Uh, and and from childhood, I sang Christian songs in school, oh. which which made me aware of God being the creator of oh. of every little thing, even a, a blade of grass or a, a a moth or a fly or a bird, and 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 it fascinated me that. God created all those trees, all the, all those people that I saw every day, even as a child, and 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 I think I fell in love with God even before I knew God. Hmm. Did you? Was there any racial discrimination to, shown towards you in those days? I think to land in a village, so many girls, all chocolate coloured. Uh, <laughs> uh, in a, in a school playground to be, you know, uh, very suntanned amongst very English people, particularly during PE classes or something where you had to wear uh, shorts or something, uh, and there was more exposure of arms or legs. Uh, people noticed you that you were uh, a foreigner, but because we were busy looking at them, we only identified with them as being the same. My, mm -hmm. my classmates to me were, were the same because I thought like them. I spoke their language mainly. Um, I ate with them in, in the dining room and so on. So everything was English, English, English. Uh, but we were still think, going to... I don't think it occurred to me that I was a foreigner no. until I became an adult. Interesting. Were you still going to the mosque? No, no, there was no mosque in Little Thorpe. Uh, but, um, so was there any religion at home or not? I think the festive, the, the, the marked occasions on a calendar were, were observed mm. in our home. For instance, mm. fasting, um, you know, and we were asked to pray five times, although we didn't pray five times because nobody was available five times of the day to pray at home. Mm. Um, and things like that. So we were like part-time Pakistanis or part-time Muslims. Mm. Uh, you couldn't be a full-time Muslim because you didn't have the environment around you. You didn't have anybody to to go and question and say, well, why does it say this in the Quran? And and do I really have to cover my hair? And, and do I really not eat pork? And why? You know, all those questions. Mm. There was mm. nobody really to to consult mm, these issues. Now, at the age of 15, you went back to Pakistan, didn't you? That's right. But prior to my going back, my, when we all came together in 1952 to Britain. Uh, this is post-war Britain. Um, and, we, uh, and it was also, in a sense, post-war Pakistan, because... Mm. I'm actually one year older than my country. Not many people can claim that. <laughs> uh, Pakistan uh, broke from uh, the time of British Raj and the time of Gandhi and Nehru and Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Muhammad Ali Jinnah is the founder of Pakistan who wanted to segregate uh, territorially uh, the land 
uh, and named it Pakistan, which means a land of purity, because Pakistanis believe in a God in heaven. Mm. As it was a uh, majority were Hindus, and mm. the Hindu people worshipped uh, many gods, man-made gods, um, uh, you know, stone gods, mm. sculptures of, of uh, sometimes half human, half uh, animal, you know, mm. elephant or something, uh, which in their, um, in their scriptural language, the Sanskrit and so on, their holy books, it has meaningful uh, explanations of, of, you know, their, their historical, it's Hinduism is, I think, one of the oldest religions. Mm. Um, and so it has a lot of myth, mythical stuff, which to Hindus is very important, mm. very real, and very today. Mm. Uh, but Pakistan was segregated from India because it did not believe in those idols. I know. So it really became quite a Muslim state, and you you found yourself back there. Yes, I I, I was three when I uh, when my parents decided to bring us to Britain, and I think my eldest two do- uh, sisters, uh, my father decided that they needed some medical attention, uh, and also to bring us to Britain and to have us all with the renowned, at that time, the best ever British education, he felt would uh, compensate for a dowry for 10 daughters to wed them Mm. off. Because Mm. to wed one daughter is a very expensive thing for a father in Pakistan. Mm. To wed 10 of them, (laughs) you know, you'd have to be something like a millionaire. So he hoped that we would uh, I don't know, qualify as lawyers and doctors or have such, bri- we'd become professors or something. Mm. We would attract uh, good um, families within to wed to in arranged yeah. marriages. But actually it backfired. We all became very Western. Uh, or we all wanted personal choices. We, we got separated from our parents and that allowed us to think individually. Mm. And to make choices individually, the way you do over whether you want to buy a a Mars bar or a a Snickers bar to eat in a sweet shop. Uh, So we had choices Mm. and we learned that from a young age, whereas had we been brought up in Pakistan, you are, are brought up to believe that it is your father or men, your elder brother, if you don't have a father, uh, an uncle or somebody who rules, mm. makes the choices and that he has the wisdom, you don't. He <laughs> has um, the manpower, the physical power, and we are the weaker sex. So we don't question, we don't mm. so accept. Was there a suggestion that you should have an arranged marriage out there? Oh, yes. In our young years, it was understood that, yes, parents would choose us. And is that what happened to you? No, it it happened to me many times in uh, in the planning and arrangements, but it never fully went there. Oh, was that because you were you were objecting? Yes, yes, because I because I had had a taste of the West, I'd had a taste of individualism, which is not encouraged in women in the Mm. East. Mm. Uh, I felt that I had uh, a mind, a mindset that could not have such an important thing decided by the world for me, but it Mm. had to come from my heart, my own heart, and my own choosing of living with someone for the rest of my life. Now, eventually you chose to go into nursing, but it's a lovely story as to how that happened. Just tell us. <laughs> well, um, after the age of 15, I went to Pakistan uh, to my own country. And I imagined Pakistan as being like Hawaii with beautiful uh, sceneries, beautiful people. Uh, and I didn't, what I didn't think would would happen is the clash I would find 
of being a female in a Muslim society and not, oh, you mustn't do this, or you can't say this, and you, you, you can't, you know, eat that, and you must cover your shoes above your, your, your uh, feet, uh, the clothes must cover up to your ankles, mm. or you must cover your head, and everything was a, because you're female, you can't, you, you mustn't behave mm -hmm. that way, mm. you mustn't talk that way. And that brought limitations to me that I found very depressing, frustrating, and and I I wanted to burst with the, with almost rebellion against it all. Mm. Uh, and so when I landed in Pakistan, I think my father had plans for our arranged marriages, three of us sisters, and it didn't work out that way. So. Um, we fought to come back and I came back without my parents' approval. I came back on borrowed money and I came back thinking, I am coming home to mm. freedom, to, to be allowed to be who I am and that I could find a career or eventually a home of my own with someone I wanted to share my life with, etc. But when I came back to Britain, we had Mr. Enoch Powell in government and the rules for immigrants were changing. Mm. And I landed at the time when Mr. Enoch Powell had made certain rules and I was to be one of these um, victims of, of immigrants that would not be allowed to, to remain in Britain. Even though I grew up in England, I had family who were wed had their own homes and careers here in Britain. But that, and, and my previous schooling was of no consequence. I, I had landed in Britain and I was not wanted here. Mm. So I was being uh, told that, you know, I could stay for a couple of weeks to visit my family, but then I would have to go back. And I'd come on borrowed money. I'd come with a lot of expectations, a lot of dreams and desires and hopes. And here I was being told, mm. you're on the next plane back. A and that hurt, that yeah. hurt deeply. So you wrote to somebody, didn't you? Yes, I was um, in my time of uh, being held uh, almost at the airport during this time, I was told that, uh, that I could not go back. So I wrote to everybody, the, any MP name I got, any uh, even doctors, lawyers, even the queen, you would laugh. <laughs> and one wrote back and her name was Marjorie Proops. She was an agony aunt in a woman's magazine I found. Everybody wrote about their boyfriend trouble to her. But I wrote saying, I want to be accepted in Britain because I, I considered it my home and I didn't want to live anywhere else. And she wrote back saying, well, we have a lot of shortage of nurses and next time the home office people come to you, just tell them you want to be a nurse. Huh. And I did. And within a week or 10 days, I was given the okay and shifted uh, uh, or shipped to Birmingham to become uh, a psychiatric nurse in a mental hospital connected with Winston Green Prison in yeah. Lodge Road in Birmingham. And I began my nursing career. Uh, and that began to, uh, you began to ask questions, didn't you? Why is the world suffering like this? You began to wonder what God was doing in all of this. Exactly. I found that I had, I saw I saw God in my mental patients. I knew that he created them, even though they didn't seem to be logically able to explain themselves. Mm. I, I, and all we did was give them the green pill or the blue pill or the yellow pill, mm. which made them walk around like zombies. But to me, I, I, I somehow in my uh, identity crisis or my dilemma of of not belonging anywhere, I identified more with them than I did with the staff. Maybe I, I was very nutty and I, maybe I still am. <laughs> but um, 
I don't know, I fell in love with my patients. I didn't, mm. except for the very violent ones, and we had mm. very violent patients. Mm. That I was a bit afraid of them, and I had mm. some uh, very horrific experiences with them, with some of them, but most of them are were so drugged uh, and were like helpless babes. Mm. And, and then I found in the dining room of the nurse's dining room, a poster saying, come and pray. The nurse's Christian union welcomes you and come and find out, you know, about yourself and about God and so on. It was a lovely poster. Mm. So I decided to go and I was at that time on an addiction ward. And on an addiction ward, we had very young, full of life, attractive people. So you, you, you were going to this Nurses Christian Fellowship, and how did you actually become a Christian, Fuzi? I didn't in Birmingham. I thought that they are Christians, I'm Muslim, and I'm here to pray for my patients. And when I finished the first half of my psychiatric nursing, I begged to be moved to the south where my family lived so I could visit because we got paid very very funny salaries like one pound a day 30 pound a month and most of it I sent home to my family in Pakistan because my younger sisters were still at school and there is no free education or no free medicine in Pakistan so most of my salary went back home because I got uniform I got fed in in, in a hospital as a staff member I didn't really need the money but I did want the, the travel money to visit my family in London. I only had one weekend off in a month. Mm. And by coach, I think at that time, it cost about five, six pounds, which was to me then a lot of money out mm. of 30 pounds. And so I wanted to be nearer my family. And when I finished my nursing uh, studies halfway and the practicals, I was moved to Holloway Sanatorium in Virginia Water, which was a, a very different culture almost because it was in the countryside. It was with the very well-offs, not like Handsworth in Birmingham, where there was this All Saints Hospital, which was in the poorer part of Birmingham then. I don't know what it's like now. I, I think it no longer exists. It's been converted into very modern, fla expensive flats. Uh, but at that time, it was a very um, old and rundown hospital. But when I moved to uh, Holloway Sanatorium, I again was amongst Christians. I, I wanted to be with people who would accept me, who did not mind my being chocolate colored or a bit alien, a bit different to them. And I felt comfortable amongst Christians. And because I continued going wherever they went, having a, a church service, having Bible studies and so on, I learned about Jesus and I woke up to a Christ I'd learned about as a child, but didn't fully comprehend until I was an adult. And then we went to a rally. We went to a rally where a university student was who was working in the mental hospital as a uh, a holiday experience from his uh, uh, university, um, but who came and asked a lot of questions that I never dared ask Christians before fear of offending them. And he asked, why do you call Jesus son of God in one place and prince of peace or, uh, or son of man? And why does he have all these titles? And, you know, why isn't he just a prophet or, you know, something like that and these were things i wanted to say to christians but i was too polite and i was too timid and i was too afraid that i would lose the only friends i have and so he when he'd asked them he got, we got the answers but he was unsatisfied in the end he just put the bible down angrily and said i'm walking out and he walked out but the the leader in that uh, Christian rally, he was a pastor, uh, asked us to all circle around, hold hands, bow our heads, and we prayed for him. 
And when we were praying, the pastor kept saying, now I'm a Muslim holding hands with Christians. The pastor kept saying, Christ has said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no man cometh to the Father but through me. This is in John 14. And I decided there and then that I, I really wanted to be with God. I, I really wanted to touch God, to feel God, to know God. It wasn't enough reading about God. It wasn't enough going to church or even as a Muslim saying my namaz, which is the, on a prayer mat, or, or reading the Quran or, or, or whatever many books I could find about God. I wanted a personal link with God. Mm -hmm. And in Islam, God is somewhere way up there, you know, somewhere even beyond the stars. But in Christianity, God is right here. He's closer to me, Roger, than you are on that screen. And, and that's what I wanted. I wanted a closeness with God. And so I went forward and I gave my life to Christ. Mm. But even then, I hadn't realized what it would mean when I would next go home to my family and be in a Muslim environment and that they would look at me as someone who no longer belonged mm. to, to the mm. a major part of me no longer belonged as a Pakistani or as a Muslim, but that I had changed. Even though I hadn't got my British passport, I was somebody different. Mm. And, you know, that they would have to accept that. And, and I was still too timid. I still lived in that fear of, of people rejecting me or maybe abusing me in some way because I'd had too much of it. And when I did go home the first time, my family happened to put on the television and it was a Sunday service. And my sisters were busy stirring the curries in the pots and the children were playing. And I was sitting there observing them and that, as well as trying to listen to the sermon on the television. And suddenly they said that they, um, their neighbors and friends or English people they worked with or knew went to, um, went to parties and things, went to, uh, and, and they allowed their daughters to go away for weekends and they even offered them a pill so they didn't get pregnant and so on. And that on then come Sunday, seven days a week, they lived this free, free life. And, and then on Sundays, they went to church and they would confess their sins to a man in church mm -hmm. and, and they'd be forgiven all their sins. They were, of course, speaking of Catholics mm -hmm. and that they would then go back home and start their life all over again mm -hmm. of the alcohol or smoking or uh, sleeping around or whatever. And I'm speaking now of Christians. And as my family was saying all this, I don't know why I, I wanted to defend the, the Christians. I knew the family mm -hmm. who had had me in their homes, who had had me babysit for their children's worry about their teenagers, etc. And I suddenly spoke up for these families and I said, no, English people are not like this. You are just judging the few that you know at, at work or, or, or who lives down the road or something. I said, I have been with families where, you know, they have very high morals. They, they believe in God and God is very real to them. And they don't want their daughters, you know, mm -hmm. um, they don't give their daughters a pill to go and stay a weekend away with a boyfriend or something that they actually care about their children. They don't want this happening, even if they have a son who wouldn't get pregnant and who would, you know, uh, they didn't want even the son to go and sleep with the girl who they were not married to, mm -hmm. uh, etc. And I, I started to, do, to speak about all these things and, and suddenly I was talking as though I, I was no longer a Muslim. And they mm. noticed that. And I could see it in their eyes that suddenly they were hearing a sister, Fuzi, that they didn't know before. Huh. And they said to me, 
it's it came down to the bottom line. They asked me a lot of questions, but they said to me, do you really believe that God has a son, that God is like any other person and he has a son and, you know, mm. and that the son is Christ. And I just, I don't know. I found myself saying, yes, mm. yes, he, we believe in this Jesus mm. and that Jesus saves. Mm. And suddenly they went and they got their Qurans, not one of them, two, three sisters. They, I had three, four Qurans opening and they were spinning through the pages and saying, look, it says here, you know, that what it happens to those who blaspheme, huh? they are to be beheaded that you have God's wrath on you now, Fuzi. There is, you know, you have said something so sinful that God will want nothing more to do with you. And this really made me panic. It really made me very, very unhappy in that I didn't want to argue. I didn't, there were two, three of them, uh, ruling over me and telling me I'd done something so bad, so horrible that it, God no longer accepted me. Hmm. And I, I, I already wasn't being accepted uh, as a resident in Britain. I wasn't accepted, uh, you know, by many English people. If I went to a shop, I knew they served the English first, me last, etc. And so, and now they were saying, I wouldn't be accepted as a human being in front of God. And so I ran away from uh, that house. I picked up my coat and bag. I'd only just arrived, but even without eating lunch, I ran back and I rang my Christian friends and they took me all the way to Seven Oaks in a car. And I met a blind Christian man and he calmed me down in such a way that, that I couldn't explain more than any pills I ever gave to my patients. Hmm. And, and he said, you know, he spoke of God being the way, the truth and life, the way that pastor had said, which is what made me go forward as a Christian. But he also said that God came down for sinners like me. And suddenly, you know, I realized that it was not important that I was white or black. But it was important that I was a sinner and that God died for me. And he, he died on that cross so horribly because of the wrong things I had done, that I had thought, that I had believed, that I had hurt my parents so much by being different, that I had rebelled against the world because I thought the world didn't understand me as a female. But that, you know, Ken was explaining a story that I identified as a child uh, where we heard tales for children. And it was tales of, of these Rajas, which is a king, and they all had their different kingdoms. And this is in India. And, and one king wanted his kingdom to be better than all the others. So what he did was he supplied all the food and land and water and whatever to each household. And anyone who sinned, like thieving, uh, had the, the worst uh, punishment. And one man is thrown before him. This is years after uh, he uh, made the rule and made everybody in his kingdom comfortable and happy. But then the first criminal is brought to him for stealing bread. And he asks the criminal, why? When I supplied everything, did you have to go and steal? And the man just said, look, you are a king. You, you sit in your palace. You don't know what is happening out there. We've had drought. We've had famine. We, you know, we haven't been able to have food. And I had, my children were hungry. I had no option but to go and steal food. So this king, although he sentences him in prison, he goes, he takes off his kingly robes and dresses as a normal man and steps out into the world and comes back a wiser, a king, how to rule his country. This is not to say 
that, the, you know, that I have explained Christianity well here, but you know, a lot of religions, they talk about, actually all other religions have the word D-O, mm. uh, do this and you can get this and, and do this and you will be rewarded for that and, or do that and, and God will forgive you and so on. But Christianity has four letters to explain it. And it's D-O-N-E. That it is all done. It's all done. God has paid the price for us on the cross. And that we don't, we could never undo our sins. We could have ablution a hundred times, not five times a day. And that we don't have to pray five times a day. We could pray 50 times a day. And we don't have to fast 30 days in a year. We could fast the whole 365 days of the year. And we couldn't wash away our sin. No mm -hmm. soap and water is good enough to clean the dirty hands we have, the dirty heart we have. That only Christ, only the Holy Spirit only God, the Trinity, is capable of cleansing us and making us the children of God, because God cannot look at us when we sin. We cannot be dirty in front of God. We cannot be sinful in front of God. And when we become Christians, it is not that we become sinless but it is that we become sin, that we sin less. <laughs> yes, indeed. You know, because we have Christ living in us and we, mm -hmm. we understand sin or, or wrongdoing in a way humans haven't yet fathomed until they know Jesus. Mm, absolutely. I'm going to come in here, Fuzi. Time is well and truly gone. Now, you married, you married an Englishman. You, it, despite what doctors said, I know eventually you became a mother. And uh, all those years ago, you trusted Christ. He's as real to you now as he was then, maybe even more so. Is that true? That is very true. Mm. And when I... Uh, give myself to the Lord in my daily reading, I think God renews and refreshes my faith in me. When I meet people like you, Roger, I know that I'm renewed and, and, and re-cleansed, like laundry ready for God, you know? And um, you're glad you're a Christian, despite the difficulties. I know the rest of your family as yet haven't come to trust Christ. Yes, it hurts me deeply. That, you know, my husband, my son, my sisters and brothers, my parents never knew Jesus. And that I wish they would experience Jesus, mm. you know, the way I have known. Mm. Because there is nothing more beautiful uh, that we can experience in life on earth. Mm. Not marriage, not sex, not winning the lottery, not anything on earth you know, having the biggest yacht and climbing the highest mountain, earning the, the, the gold medal to be a, as an athlete or whatever, nothing makes up for the, the joy we have in knowing Christ as our saviour. Mathusa, thank you very, very much. It's been a joy to, to hear you and to, um, as it were, participate in your story. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you to Roger and to Fousey. That was fascinating just to hear of God's work and, and another real life, another changed life uh, through coming to trust in the Lord Jesus. So thank you, Roger, and thank you, Fousey. As I said, it's good to have Vinny here with us tonight. He's up in Merseyside, so I'm going to hand over to him now. So Vinny, over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you, David. And can I say a very big thank you to Fousey? That was a fascinating story and interview. And uh, great to see how God's working in your life. Um, one of the things I picked up on in that story is that Fuzi was one of 12. Well, the word is snap. I'm one of 12. And whereas you had 10 girls, two boys, we had six and six. And you're listening to number nine. 
So thank you very much, Fousey, for your story. Now, it wouldn't take you long to realise that one of the themes that came out from Fousey's interview was this word, wanting to be accepted. And she wanted to be accepted in a family. She wanted to be accepted in Britain. And uh, she wanted to be accepted, if you like, in her own self. And uh, it's a tremendous thing to feel accepted. When I was growing up, um, though I was in a big family, I was also in, if you like, other families. They were called teams. And to be part of a team, whatever that sport was, you felt very much accepted. But most of all, it's best to be accepted in the family of God. I'll just read to you one or two verses, and then we'll consider this great word accepted together. It says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 14, He himself is our peace and has made one and has broken down the middle wall of division between us, having abolished in the flesh the enmity that is in the law of the commandments, containing ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, therefore, therefore putting to death the enmity. He came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Well, acceptance. You see, the problem for all of us is when we're born, we might be part of a human family, but we're not part of God's family. And that is because our nature is very different to that of God's himself. See, we have a nature that pulls us down. As time goes on, you listen to people's speech and you realize what comes out of them is something from the heart. And the Bible says the heart is the, if you like, the well that contains the sin. And out it comes in people's language and speech. And even the best of us can make a mess sometimes and get things wrong. And that's why the Bible says we're sinners. So when we're born, we're born with a nature that's actually anti-God. And our problem is the character of God himself. You see, though we might have a nature of sin, God is holy. God is pure. He's altogether lovely. He's separated from sins. He's undefiled. And the heavens of heavens can't contain him. And he's also there. Those people who don't believe there is a God, it's like saying, I, I don't believe in the weather. Well, you might not like the weather, but you can't do much about the weather. You've always got it. And God is ever present in his universe because he's the maker. And we come into the world. OK, we're in a human family, but we're not in God's family. And that's what Fusi found for herself. So the big question is, how do we get accepted into God's family? Well, first of all, we must realize that we have a problem. And the problem is me and the problem is you. And the problem is the nature of God himself. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. The Bible says God is light and in him there's no darkness at all. We are not like that. Many years ago, there were two prisoners they were released from the basement of the Bastille prison in France, in Paris. And the prison that they were um, incarcerated in, it had no windows. So when it was dark, it was really dark. And they lived in darkness for many months, these prisoners. The time they were released was deliberately at night. And they went out into the dark streets of Paris. It was noted that at sunrise they were banging on the door of the Bastille, let us back in. You see, they'd lived in a darkness and they'd come to meet the light. And they couldn't cope with it. And God is light and we are darkness. We don't understand him. We don't get him. We don't reason like he reasons. That's why Jesus had to say to a teacher of Israel, are you not the top man? Are you not the leader? Nicodemus, are you not the great teacher of the Jews? And you don't understand what I'm telling you. Well, 
when we realize that we've got a problem and our problem is the nature of God himself and our nature, we can try and do something about it. Do you remember what Fusi said? She said two words to sum up all religions, D-O, do. Whether it's striving to be good, whether it's going through re religious ceremonies, whether it's being confirmed, whether it's being baptized, all those things are do, do, do from man's behalf. But we can't do enough to please a holy God who's got a different nature. So she also went on to give the good news, didn't she? She said two more letters, D-O-N-E, done. And that's the great news for mankind. You see, Jesus, who never did any wrong, who was altogether lovely, he came into the world and he's made peace, as our reading was. He has made peace by the blood of his cross. We couldn't make the peace. We couldn't be in his family. We weren't in his team. But when Jesus died, the Bible says that the gates, if you like, of heaven were opened and we could go in and through. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to ask you this evening, are you in the family of God? Now, Fusi wasn't, and she became a Christian as a psychiatric nurse even. But what about you? What about me? Am I in God's family? You see, you may have the name tonight of being a Christian, but that name won't put you in the team or the family. Way back in the 1970s, there was a team in Yorkshire called Leeds United. It was the best football team in Britain. It was run by a man called Don Revy. One man who was so obsessed with Leeds United and had a child, named his child officially on the birth certificate, all the first team and squad at Leeds United. So let's say he named his child Adam. Then came 14 other names, Remner, Maidley, Lorimer, Jones, Reney. These were the names of the first team at Leeds United. The man was absolutely cracked on the team. So his boy, whether he liked Leeds United or not, got all those names. Do you know something, that boy? He's got all the names, but he's not in the team. And you tonight might have the name of, I'm a Christian. But are you in God's family? Are you in God's team? Has there ever come a time when God's nature has become yours? You've been born again. You've got a new start. You've got a new life. The life of God in the soul of man, as one man described it. Well, this is what we must do. We must come as we are not bringing our good works or ceremonies to the foot of the cross where Jesus died. And on that cross, understand that he was laying down his life, shedding his blood, being punished for the wrong we've all done. You see, the God who by nature we are against is holy and pure. He can't allow sin to enter his world of heaven. And that's why, as we are, we can't turn up there. We need his forgiveness and we need his new nature and we need him to bring us into his family. He'll do it. Our job is to put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, repenting of our sins, say, Lord God, I don't want to live without you anymore. I would like to become your child. And ask him then to come and wash you, cleanse you, forgive you, and most of all, to live within you. If you do ask Jesus to forgive you, he'll start a new nature inside. The old will be done away with in the courts of heaven. The sin will be gone. And God will look upon you as righteous as Jesus Christ. When I became a Christian at the age of 19, I remember one man said something lovely to me. He said, Vincent, you've been chosen to wear the robes of Jesus Christ. And I thought that was a wonderful thing, that when he looked on my life, he could see the robes of Christ. Well, folks, we've had a great story tonight. But 
you may be a person who's thinking about Christian things or maybe sat on a fence wondering what to do. This is what God says. Jesus commands every man everywhere to repent. He says, come, come as a child and receive Christ. He says, believe on the Lord Jesus, you shall be saved. He says, I can give you peace. I can give you hope. I can give you purpose. I can give you meaning. And most of all, I can give you heaven. And in a world where there's very little hope at the moment, folks, it's a wonderful thing to know heaven is your home and you're in the family of God. Thank you, Fauzi. I'm going to hand now back to Dave. Thanks, Dave. Thank you, Vinny. Uh, really appreciate that. Thank you for uh, just sharing with us and pointing us to a wonderful saviour, uh, the one who accepts us when we turn from our sin and trust in him. If you'd like to know more about becoming a Christian, trusting in Christ, or if we can be of help to you, please do get in touch. Um, you can go to the website reallives.net, two L's in the middle, be up on the screen uh, just as we finish tonight. Um, do get in touch with us on there if we can be of help to you. Been really good to have you all here with us tonight. Don't forget to come back next week again for Timothy Cho, who escaped not just once but twice from North Korea. But that's all for tonight. Uh, been really good to have you here with us tonight, and may God bless you all. Good night. There's a way back to God from the dark paths of sin. A door that is open and you may go in An old wooden cross is where you begin When you come as a sinner to Jesus And all that can stop you is your foolish pride Won't you admit that you've cheated and lied that is the reason the dear Savior died. So come as a sinner to Jesus. Won't you come as a sinner to Jesus? Peace and forgiveness, the satisfied mind, the sum of the treasures of heaven you'll find. So leave what is hateful and hurtful behind And come as a sinner to Jesus There's a way back to God from the dark paths of sin A door that is open and you may go in Calvary's cross is where you begin When you come as a sinner to Jesus Won't you come as a sinner to Jesus Please come as a sinner to Jesus